Okay. Hi, my name is Lauren, and my group and I are here to talk to you about gene editing technology, specifically CRISPR-Cas9 today. According to a Centers for Disease Control report posted November 1, 2018, approximately 120,000 babies are born with genetic diseases in the U.S. alone. Um, gene editing technology, specifically CRISPR-Cas9, has the ability to eliminate a plethora of genetic diseases, but not all people are informed with gene editing because it, has, it also has the ability to edit specific traits like code for height, hair color, eye color, etc. According to a report posted by the Pew Research Center, a majority of Americans support the idea of using gene editing with the goal of delivering direct health benefits for babies, but at the same time, a majority considers the use of such techniques to boost a baby's intelligence something that takes technology too far. Imagine your child was at risk for a genetic-related disease. Would you use CRISPR-Cas9? Whether or not you answered yes or no, my group and I are here to inform you about CRISPR-Cas9 technology. Today we will discuss the history, development, how it works, future uses, risks, and ethical and moral concerns of CRISPR-Cas9. To better understand uh, the technology as a whole, I will go over the history and development of this technology. Next slide. So as you can see on my timeline here, uh, uh, CRISPR research was first published in 1987. Before the 1980s, not many people knew about gene editing technology. Until Japanese scientists at Osaka University noticed a strange pattern of DNA sequences in E. coli. This strange pattern had five repeating sequences with a spacer in between, hence the name Clustered Regularly Interspaced Palindromic Repeat, or CRISPR. In 2002, specifically March, um, scientists discovered and published research uh, about Cas9, a tagged ending onto CRISPR, which is another DNA sequence that always followed the CRISPR gene. Uh, fast forward to 2013, when CRISPR made huge steps in modifying genomes. So coincidentally, different labs are at around the same time published material on how they use CRISPR to edit human genomes. And also in January of 2013, um, labs posted research on how they edited zebrafish. According to PubMed.gov, a branch of the National Institute of Health, we now demonstrate that CRISPR-Cas9 mutant genesis in zebrafish is highly efficient reaching up to 86% and inheritable. So a little definition, mutagenesis is mutation. To take into context, um, mutagenesis, um, CRISPR could mutate the DNA, um, and it was 86% accurate, which is something that had never been done before, and is heritable, which means it can be passed on from generation to generation. In 2015, uh, CRISPR made a help, was helpful in a huge step towards uh, reducing an organ shortage by aiding in stem cell research that modified pig embryos to create usable organs for humans to transplant, which also helped limit transplant complications. And also in December of 2015, research was published on how CRISPR-Cas9 could improve muscle function in mice with muscular dystrophy, and in 2017, research was shown to eliminate HIV, uh, uh, CRISPR could eliminate HIV in affected mice. And now the jack with how CRISPR works. Thank you. So right now I'm going to be discussing how it works. So how many of you in here by show of hands would say that you're familiar with how CRISPR-Cas9 engineering works? Alright, now I'm going to show a short video from the Mayo Clinic, which is a widely regarded hospital. From 114 to 124. Or from 14. By a system called CRISPR Cas9. CRISPR is short for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. CRISPR consists of two components the Cas9 protein that can cut DNA and a guide RNA that can recognize the sequence of DNA to be edited. To use CRISPR Cas9, Scientists first identify the sequence of the human genome that's causing a health problem. Then, they create a specific guide RNA to recognize that particular stretch of A's, T's, G's, and C's in the DNA. The guide RNA is attached to the DNA cutting enzyme Cas9, and then this complex is introduced to the target cells. It locates the target letter sequence and cuts the DNA. At that point, scientists can then edit the existing genome 
by either modifying, deleting, or inserting new sequences. It effectively makes CRISPR-Cas9 a cut and paste tool for DNA editing. And now I have a quote from the U.S. National Library of Medicine, published on October 1st, 2019. Researchers create a small piece of RNA with a short guide sequence that attaches to a specific target sequence of DNA in the genome. The RNA also binds to the Cas9 enzyme. As in bacteria, the modified RNA is used to recognize the DNA sequence and the Cas9 enzyme cuts the DNA at the targeted location. Although Cas9 is the enzyme used most often, other enzymes can also be used. Once the DNA is cut, researchers use the cell's own DNA repair machinery to add or delete pieces of genetic material or to make changes to the DNA by replacing an existing segment with a customized DNA sequence. And one common way that I like to tell people about CRISPR-Cas9 is that the enzyme acts as a microscopic scissor which cuts open the DNA, and the CRISPR technology acts as a microscopic pencil which allows scientists to write in whatever genes they want into the genome. Now that we know how it works, Brandon will show us how scientists will be able to further utilize this new technology in the future. Paul Knopfler, an associate professor at UC Davis School of Medicine, said that CRISPR-Cas9 makes me feel like a kid in a candy store. This is because CRISPR-Cas9 has the ability to do so many things and change the future. According to an article from Vox.com published December 27, 2018, scientists are still in the early stages of using CRISPR-Cas9, but they have already begun to see four major ways that CRISPR-Cas9 will be able to change the world. The first way will be able to edit a crop's genotype. Being able to edit a crop's genotype will allow scientists to make crops last longer, make them healthier, taste better, and withstand heat waves or droughts. And imagine a world where you wouldn't have to worry about allergies. That's what this can do. The second way is to prevent genetic diseases. The spread of genetic diseases is all around the world. Imagine that you have a genetic disease such as sickle cell or hemophilia and you don't want this trait to be passed on to your child. CRISPR-Cas9 can take that gene or trait or segment of DNA out and put in a new one that won't have that trait. The third way is to be able to create new antibiotics and antivirals. Currently, the U.S. is running low on effective antibiotics, and to make these effective bio antibiotics are very costly. CRISPR-Cas9 will be able to make antibiotics more precise than ever and at a way cheaper price. The, four, the fourth way CRISPR-Cas9 will be able to change the world is through changing a whole species genotype. Take male mosquitoes, for example. Male mosquitoes have the ability to carry malaria. CRISPR-Cas9 is working on forcing mosquitoes to have offspring of only females to reduce the numbers of mosquitoes carrying malaria. That being said, CRISPR-Cas9 is still has so many more things to be able to change the world with. But now that we've covered that, here's Arnold to talk about some risks. So I'm going to be talking about the risk of CRISPR-Cas9 and GNing as a whole. Um, the first main risk of CRISPR-Cas9 would be the off-target effects of GNing. This is an example of an off-target effect on this side and on this side that's like normal using CRISPR-Cas9. So an off-target effect is basically an unwanted change in the gene. Keith Sprites with um, Nature's Medicine said that off-target effects have been experienced with all three types of gene editing, and we're not yet sure how big of a deal they're going to be. Uh, CRISPR-Cas9 can cause hundreds of off-target effects, such as many, many other things. And like Keith said, we don't know how bad these are, these are going to be, but they definitely will have an effect on the future of the use of CRISPR-Cas9. Scientists at Harvard say that because of the same rate of growth, using CRISPR-Cas9, the uh, off-target effects might not be that big a deal in the future. The second biggest risk with CRISPR-Cas9 use would be that it has a potential risk to cause cancer, but we're not sure how big a deal this is as well. In 2018, two papers were published on this topic by Nature Medicine. CRISPR-Cas9 can react with a gene called P53, which can have a bad reaction and has the potential to cause cancer. 
Well, not, it's not really a showstopper for the use of CRISPR-Cas9, but it is a pretty big deal. And it can also lead to other types of diseases, but it can also lead to the cure of other types of diseases. The third risk of CRISPR-Cas9 would be biological attacks. Um, biological attacks would mean that you can use gene editing to make weapons of mass destruction and genetical, I mean, genetically engineered bacteria. Um, in 2016, the director of national intelligence named James Clapper put gene editing in the weapons of mass destruction list because it has a uh, potential danger. It's not yet to where it can be, but in the future it will definitely cause some problems. And also, CRISPR-Cas9 is in inexpensive and very easy to use, so it's very dangerous if it gets in the wrong hands. And it might be still far-fetched for now, but in the future it can definitely you know, go pretty bad. So now to loop with the ethical and moral risks of CRISPR Cas9. Okay, and there's four types of ethical and moral concerns. The first type is concerns, type two safety, type three, quality and justice, type four, embryo testing. This is from the National Human Genome Research Center. First type, uh, consent. Let's imagine you get genome tested. Testing done. You have like some random gene edited, not supposed to do anything. Say 100 years from now, you have a descendant that's born without figuring out because of what you did. There's no way to get that person's consent when you're getting your genes edited. And that's one of the major concerns with gene editing. Second type is safety. Uh, it hasn't been a lot of human testing, so it can still consider uh, risky and unsafe. Third type, quality and justice. Let's imagine you're going in for a job interview. There's two people. One has had their genes edited to not have allergies, to not get sick. They're not going to miss days of work. They're not going to spread illnesses to other employees. And then the other one is just a regular old Joe. You're going to hire the guy with the gene editing because he's going to be the better employee. He's not going to take sick days. He's not going to get people sick. And because of cost, the cost of CRISPR-Cas9 definitely creates a gap between the rich class and the poor class. You're going to have the rich class getting more jobs due to editing and the poor class getting less jobs. And then uh, final type, embryo testing. There's the government, scientists, there's no set time when an embryo, a human embryo, becomes a living person. So there's no like time when the testing is like considered acceptable and no time when it's not. But scientists think this will lead to a cure to Parkinson's, spinal cord injuries, cardinal pathy and burns, and that's from the Journal of Molecular Biology. Now back to uh, Jack and the conclusion. As we have learned, CRISPR-Cas9 has some outstanding abilities in order to edit DNA, which can eliminate undesirable genetic conditions. According to the NIH, the National Institute of Health, CRISPR-Cas9 holds promise for the treatment and prevention of more complex diseases such as cancer, heart disease, mental illness, and HIV. We've learned all about the capabilities of CRISPR-Cas9, however, it's not without various setbacks risks and concerns that may ultimately delay the widespread use of CRISPR-Cas9. Going back to the hypothetical situation posed in the introduction, your own child is at risk for developing a disease that can be prevented through these new technological advancements. After being informed about CRISPR-Cas9 by discussing the history, how it works, the future uses, the risks, and the ethical as well as the moral concerns of CRISPR-Cas9, would you use this new biotechnology on your own child?